This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. This is Matthew chapter 14, beginning at the 13th verse. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the, the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I want to uh, look with you at the Old Testament lesson for this morning. Uh, it is, uh, it's a significant passage and event uh, for uh, the community of faith as we continue to kind of grow through history. It's one of those stories that's, that's pivotal for us and it identifies us as the people of God. Uh, it's about uh, Jacob. You'll remember who Jacob is, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the brother of Esau. Uh, and so you'll remember that story of uh, Jacob and Esau, that they were twins, brothers, who were uh, to be born uh, at about the same time, but it was uh, Esau that ended up coming out first of the birth canal, but then we remember that Jacob was the one who uh, had his hand grasping at the, bro at, the, at the heel of his brother as he came out. And so it was that Jacob deserved his title, um, Jacob, the name Jacob, which means usurper, um, conniver, if you will. Um, and so, uh, so Jacob continued to, and Esau continued to have this rivalry as it was Esau who was the legitimate uh, firstborn of the family, the inheritor of the blessing and promise. And yet it was Jacob who was continually pushing himself uh, to the fore to be able to receive the blessing. Uh, and so uh, he, working with his mother, Esau was kind of more his dad's guy. Um, uh, uh, Jacob uh, leaned more towards his mother. And so he and his mother kind of conspired together uh, and they, uh, they deprived his brother Esau of his first, his birthright, and then uh, ultimately later on, um, his blessing as the eldest of the two brothers. Uh, and so angry was Esau at the, this unjust uh, um, usurpation of his, of his right uh, that he swore that once his parents, their parents had died, he would kill his brother Jacob. Hearing that, uh, Jacob speaks with his mother and he decides things uh, are a little hot and he wants to get out of town. And he also then, there's an opportunity for him uh, to go and find a wife someplace. And so they go and uh, he goes and he finds uh, kind of a welcome with his uncle, uh, his mother's brother, uh, to be able to stay with them. He works uh, for him. And you'll remember the story we've been reading in the Old Testament lessons on Sunday. Uh, that he works for seven years in order to win his first bride. And so the, the bride comes down the aisle and they're married and then he pulls back the veil and all of a sudden, surprise, <laughs> it's, uh, it's her sister, not the one that he was in love with at all. And so his uncle says to him, oh, you know, it, it wouldn't be appropriate if I had given to you her younger sister. And so I'll tell you what, here's a deal. So work for another seven years and I'll give you the one that you intended to be your bride. And so he does that. So he works for another seven years. So that's 14 years. He stays for, uh, for another um, six years. And so 20 years he's been there with his, uh, with his uncle Laban. Uh, and yet the time comes 
the time comes for him to, to he's matured, uh, and the time comes for him to, be, to go back and to be reunited with his family. And we have to say it's not just the relationship, but it is all in God's providence. You know, God's providence works whether we're conniving or not. God finds his way in order to be able to accomplish his purposes even through our weaknesses. And so Jacob knows that he's got the responsibility for this covenant, for this promise that has been given to him. And so he knows the time has come. And so 20 years later, he makes his way back home, back to the land of promise. And he sends some of his servants ahead to kind of find out what's going on and to let them know, let his brother Esau know uh, that he's coming. And uh, the, the servant, then the messenger, comes back to Jacob and tells Jacob, oh, your brother is very interested in the fact that you're coming back home to claim your blessing. In fact, he's coming out to meet you with 400 really big guys. And so Jacob is terrified. And so he, he is standing on the edge of a river. He takes both of his wives and all of their kids and, and, uh, and associates and sends them over to the other side of the river so that there's a boundary in some way between them and his oncoming brother. He takes uh, uh, others of his servants and he takes the finest of his flocks and he sends them out towards Esau to hopefully placate um, his brother's anger as he's coming at him. And so as we come to, this, to the story for this morning, uh, Jacob is left, is left finally, the sun is setting, uh, Jacob is left by himself, alone, in the dark, to wrestle with his thoughts, his history, what he's done, his brokenness, and the promise of God. ever do that? Find yourself in the middle of the dark, wrestling with your past, your history, your brokenness, your mortality, and someplace the promise of God. It's a story of grace. Because in the middle of the darkness, all of a sudden, this strange, mysterious man appears. He comes, and he and Jacob begin to wrestle. It's mysterious because uh, he takes on, in some ways, the, the, the presence of God himself, but yet uh, but the, 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 the sense of uh, an, an emissary from God, an angel from God. Uh, this representative of God, this embodiment of God, comes and begins to wrestle with him. And yet, when we look at other, both Old and New Testament uh, presences of God, when God kind of reveals himself and shows up in the presence of an angel, uh, we know that all of a sudden it's, that's an, an overpowering experience, right? It's an, it's an experience of tremendous terror because you see this awesome presence of the holy God in front of you, and you just, you just fall on your face in front of him. But this one comes, and he's not overwhelming. He's not overpowering. He's a match for Jacob. And so the two of them wrestle, and they wrestle long, and they wrestle hard, and Jacob has to give everything that he can in combat uh, for the, with, this, with this unexpected man. And as they wrestle, finally, towards the end, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the man from God uh, touches Jacob's hip to end the discussion. And his hip is put out of place. And we're told that from that point on, uh, Jacob limps. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, we oftentimes think that, uh, that when we come to Christ, when we enter into the life of faith, that our struggles have ended. You know, oftentimes, it is exactly at the point of coming to Christ that finally we're prepared to wrestle, that we know the importance of the truth, that we know the importance of love, 
that we know what it means, at least we know what it ought to mean, to be able to be built into a community of character that actually cares for and comes to the aid of the people around us. We know how important it is that we're able to surrender the things that are destructive in our lives and the need to be able to press forward into a life of light and love. And so this opportunity to be able to wrestle with the presence of God in our lives, it's just, it's gracious. It gives to us the opportunity to develop the spiritual muscles to be able to handle the promises and the covenant that God offers to us. Without wrestling, there is no opportunity. Without wrestling, there is no love. Without wrestling, there is no opportunity to prepare ourselves for the good things that God gives to us. I remember when I was in junior high, um, I went out to the wrestling team. And uh, I went to practice, and, and I saw the, the guy who was the coach for us. Uh, and uh, he was a guy who had been a victim of polio. And his, from his waist down, uh, he was deformed. And so he had two, two crutches, one on each arm, that he walked with. Uh, but his, uh, he really couldn't use his legs except kind of as a prop um, for where he, where, he, where he would stand. And so he would, he would kind of make his way uh, down the hallway. Uh, he could do that with those two crutches. And so I saw him, and I said, and he's the wrestling coach. And I was like, what does he mean? No. <laughs> so he just is doing this as, a, as an extra job to make a little bit more money. He doesn't really know anything about wrestling. Um, well, so then the time came for practice. And, uh, and I got out with, uh, with one of my um, colleagues, and we were wrestling, and he said, no, that's not the way you do it, a particular move. And I said, well, okay. And so he uh, set aside his crutches, and he, with his arms, propelled himself out into the middle of the mat. And he said, come and try to pin me. And uh, so I went out, and I tried my <laughs> unpracticed moves on him. And I will tell you, in the blink of an eye, I was a pretzel. Because this guy, as much as his body from his waist on was deformed, um, his upper body was, <laughs> was incredibly muscular, and he could lift me with no trouble at all. Uh, and yet, gracious in terms of coming onto the mat and wrestling with me and not overpowering me, teaching me what it meant to be able to wrestle, what it meant to be able to maneuver ourselves to be able to wrestle with God doesn't mean that something's wrong with us. Because things are hard, it doesn't mean that we've screwed up. We all screw up. We're all sinners. Amen? Amen. So just because things are hard or don't work out the way we think they should doesn't mean we've screwed up or that God has somehow forgotten us. It's the price that we pay for getting on the mat, coming into a relationship with this God who loves us and who wants to wrestle with us wants to teach us, wants to see our muscles grow for us to be able to develop. And it means that there are times, always, there are times after we wrestle that we sometimes, as, as Jacob's hip became displaced, um, that we walk with a limp. In this life, as followers of Jesus, we will always walk with a limp. There will always be something about us that will remind us of our own mortality, of our own limits. I think of you know, St. Paul, who had the thorn in the flesh, a messenger, he called it, uh, from Satan sent to buffet me. And he said, three times I prayed for God to remove this. And God's response to him was, no, nah, I don't think so. Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. It is in our weaknesses that the glory of God is revealed. And so this opportunity to be able to wrestle, not pretend that we're God, not pretend that we're somehow transcendent above it all, but that we need him, and we need to work together to be able to claim his promises. And so it's significant, then, that, uh, that after this wrestling match, uh, the, the man of God um, asked Jacob his name. And Jacob said, well, my name is Jacob, meaning usurper conniver. And uh, the man of God says, no, no more. He said, your name now is Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. Isn't it interesting that that becomes the name of the people of God, the people of Israel, that from that point on, the community of faith is a community of people who wrestle with God. 
So in the midst of this life, we find ourselves surrounded by the, the, all of the questions and all of the difficulties and all of the hardships and the dark and, and all of the questions that come to us in the darkness of the night and all of our insecurities. And yet to be able to know God meets us and he wrestles with us in the midst of it in order to be able to give us and to bring us to a place of promise and bounty that he has prepared for us. And so in this world, we don't always know how things will turn out. But we know that with him, always there is victory. Always there is opportunity. Always there is a covenant. Always there is a promise. And so in the midst of darkness, we cling to it. We hold on to it. And we proclaim our faith in him, even as we wrestle in the middle of the night. I don't know if you uh, have been following, I'm sure you have, uh, the, the, um, the news report about the doctor who uh, was serving in West Africa. Uh, who acquired, because of his work, uh, acquired the Ebola virus, and so has been struggling um, there. I have to say that you know, oftentimes in the news, you know, they describe uh, folks like this as aid workers. Can we just say they were missionaries? I mean, these folks were there. He served uh, as a staff person for the Samaritan first, and he was there because he loved Jesus and was serving uh, people in West Africa in order to communicate the love of Christ and the healing power of Christ to, to the people who are there. I just wish you know, NBC News would proclaim that. <laughs> and so as, uh, as uh, he, is, he is struggling, wrestling for his life, uh, uh, and now we know that he's coming back here to the United States, a letter was uh, released by his wife. Um, his, his name is uh, Dr. Kent Brantley, and his wife's name is Amber. And so she wrote this letter, kind of a public letter, to kind of inform people about how they were doing. Um, she said, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the many people who have reached out to me and my family during this difficult time. Thank you to our good friends and thousands more who have been in constant prayer and fasting for Kent's deliverance from this disease. Also, thank you to the Samaritans first for their warmth, uh, professionalism, and support that they have extended to us. I remain hopeful and believing that Kent will be healed from this dreadful disease. I am grateful for the daily reports I receive from his doctors on the ground. He is strong and peaceful and confident in the love of Jesus Christ, which is his sustenance right now. Many people have been asking how I am doing. The children and I are physically fine. We had left Liberia prior to Kent's exposure to the virus. I am always anxiously awaiting any news from Liberia regarding Kent's condition. Through the mountaintops and the valleys of this ordeal, I have been given a peace that comes from my relationship with God. Jesus remains the rock that I lean on. I feel strengthened each passing hour by your prayers. Through letters and comments, we have felt God's love and comfort poured out to us from literally every corner of the world. Do, do we know how it's going to end up? The final, the final you know, paragraph of that story hadn't been written. But the presence of Christ the opportunity for her to be able to experience the presence of Christ in the midst of the darkness, to be able to wrestle and to be able to know that he will be victorious and that there will be an opportunity for, whether it's in this world or in the world to come, to be able to know that Christ is triumphant and love always wins, that light always shines, that hope is always the best bet as we have the, 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 the compassion of Christ that comes uh, to our aid. Um, the uh, the story of Jacob and Esau and their reuniting is a joyous one. Um, you'll remember that Esau was coming with his 400 soldiers, and Esau was terrified. And we're told in, the, in, uh, in Genesis, we're told uh, that as he's approaching, um, uh, Jacob himself, now Israel, um, went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Um, that says pretty scared, do you think? <laughs> Bowed seven times. But he says, Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Just opportunity for promise. The missed opportunity for joy when we do not allow Christ to continue to work in our lives, even in the midst of the darkness, and to allow him to be able to bring us courage to be able to face the challenges that are in front of us, in front of us and to be able to see where it is that he will take us and what it is that he will do and how it is that he will raise us to new life. So to be able to trust in him, to know that he's faithful and that wherever it is that we wrestle, however it is, however long it can seem, 
we will always win with him on our side. Thanks be to God.